Hey, what's up? So I'm going to cover the line by line chimp pie game tutorial, but I'm going to, I've already refactored it into a more pure object oriented programming uh, structure. So I'm going to briefly skim through what the chimp is, what it's doing, and then also talk about how I refactored it. So in a nutshell here, if we look at the chimp code, this is the Pygame chimp line by line tutorial off of their main, if you go to like help contents and uh, tutorials and then chimp line by line, that should get you there. And in here we could see it's a uh, name chimp, blah, 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 it talks about what it is. It's just, you slide this hand around and you smash the chimp. It's super basic. But it illustrates a few important concepts of like creating like the most basic kind of a game or just about the most basic kind of a game. I have some previous tutorials that cover an even more basic to a certain extent type of game. But anyway, without further ado, here's what they have for their first code block. And uh, I've compared the two files side by side right here. Sorry, the syntax highlighting isn't exactly the best, but... This is um, effectively like exactly the same stuff as they're shown right here. Import modules, OS, pi game, if the two if statements, and then the two variables getting set. Pop over here, we can see there's the imports, the if statements, the variables getting set. And then over here is my refactored file. And uh, if I click right here in between it, we can see the lines that are similar but different. And what I'm doing instead of importing, they imported OS, and instead I import the path module from Pathlib, or I should say the path class from the Pathlib module, and I also import sys for sys to be able to call sys exit. So I kind of changed that part up. Otherwise, we both import Pygame as PG. So wherever you see PG, that's the Pygame module. And then when we come down here a little bit, what I did is I removed these checks in mind. They're no longer just floating around in space like that. Since my thing's object-oriented, or at least striving to be, it um, everything's inside of a class, pretty much just like how you would do in some a language, maybe like Java would force you to do that. I've gone ahead and done that. And to some extent, some of it's not the biggest deal in the world because... Um, Whatever, with a game this small, it's it's just not a huge deal. But the cool thing is, is that by doing that, I have like a game class. And right here, I have a media class. So everything's going to, for media, will be namespaced under like media dot load image. Instead of just over here, they have a global function against the rail. Uh, where'd that go? Right here. This def load image, it's... See how this one's indented? These little dots represent like individual space characters. Um, it's indented within the class. So obviously it's namespaced inside that class. We have to say media dot load image, like I was saying. For this def dot load image that isn't namespaced in the class, uh, we just say load image from anywhere inside of anything. It's just already floating around in the global namespace right now. Like I said, a little tiny program, not a huge deal usually, but we kind of want to start to build something that can scale and scale cleanly and doesn't have a bunch of random classes or excuse me, ra random classes for one thing, but uh, random functions and variables floating around. And then let's say we had a separate file. That file would then need to import this one, which is, I renamed it to chimp212 because it's the version of chimp that comes with Pygame 2.1.2. We would need to import this file. So if it was just called chimp, like originally it was, we'd say import chimp. And that sort of isn't really, it's counterintuitive to to think of like load image as part of the chimp file, right? Because it's it's just not sort of specialized in what it's doing and everything. So anyway, by putting that stuff in a media, class then i'm more tempted if i were to get a lot of code like hundreds of lines or more in this source file then i'd probably start breaking classes out into their own files or their own sub modules or something and uh i'd probably name the file like media so then i'd have 
media dot media. I don't know. I would do something so that, and then instead of it just being chimp, but I'll shut up and just move on here and try not to ramble too much. So yeah, we've just got this little, I'm not a big fan of these anymore. Like I used to be a uh, user bin environment Python. So that's so that you can call the script. You can make it executable in a Linux like shell, like bash. And, uh, it will automatically try and invoke this interpreter. So some Linux distributions call it Python for Python 3. Other ones like Debian based, you have to specifically say Python 3. And then in Windows, it's entirely different. And you just say PY and then like a dash 3 or a dash 3.8 or whatever version you want to force it to use. So anyway, it's different on various systems. And I think it's just ridiculous. So that's a totally optional line. I changed mine to Python 3 because I think I tested it in Debian. Here's just a comment that describes the source file or the program as a whole in general. So that's not a huge deal. Like I said, there's the imports. So there's the if statements. What I did with these if statements, because they're missing over here, is I went ahead, I'll show you not too long from now. Um, I put the one related to PG font. I put that inside of the object that's dealing with writing text to the screen. And then this PG mixer warning sound, I put that right over here inside of this class media. I went down to uh, this load sound here. And there you can see, if not PG mixer, then warning sound disabled. So it's now encapsulated against the related functionality of loading the sound and all that kind of a thing instead of just floating around in space because that's the idea with object oriented programming is like you want to keep the data and all that stuff is like encapsulated and close together is makes sense within reason so everything to do with sound really should be right here in this simple program to do with mine as far as loading sounds and all that so that's what i did and what else do we have here? So there's the free floating load sound. And what they did with their free floating load sound, let me deselect that. They uh, they put this class thing first thing. So that class is going to get parsed. So if I jump over here, I also have the same exact file open in uh, Python's idle editor. So if I come down to this load sound thing, and I'll go ahead and just add a decorator. I'll add like a an F1 decorator right there. And then what I can do is just add a, uh, hmm, maybe I should add it outside of the whole class. I don't know. Just, oh, we are outside of a whole class because we're in that original thing. Okay, I'm going to add that decorator, and it's going to be called F1. And it's going to take a class because that's just what Python does. It passes the class. So what it will do is it will call this F1 function right here before, like, as soon as it parses this part right here, it will actually call this function. It will pass it this class right here as that value. So what I'm going to do is print, uh, we are in F1. And then what we're supposed to do is return, generally speaking, return that class like that. And so what that will do is it's gonna call this function First, that function is going to do whatever it wants, which we're just going to print that we're in there to the console. And then it's going to return an instance of the class. So from then on, it will behave just like as if we were defining this class, writing that definition out. So if I hit F5, yes, it's okay to save. Okay, I'm going to close this. And you can see it says we are in F1 right there. So it parsed this class. It even though we have sound. So I didn't demonstrate the sound, of course, but there's sound there. So my point is, is that this class is getting created no matter what. So what I did over here is I actually, you can see here's the if statement that I talked about earlier. I, I moved that down into here and I pushed this class definition down. So what happens is it says, you know, basically if the, if the mixer is not initialized, then print the warning warning class disabled and then parse this class so it only gets parsed if the mixer is not enabled 
And then if it parses that class, it goes ahead and returns it. And so what's going on there is it's returning like an empty class that has this same play method, sort of like an empty interface. And it just does nothing when you call it. So that's that's cool, though. That idea that they did that, that's very object-oriented in itself. So I just made it like slightly more optimized by not having it be parsed unless it's absolutely necessary. So otherwise, what it's going to do for most of us that have sound enabled, it's going to come in here and uh, load this particular, whatever file we're trying to load, whatever sound file. So that'd be like the whiff sound for the fist when it miss, the smack sound when it actually makes contact with something and so on. This is different obviously than the way they did it. They used the OS path join, data directory, da da da, all that kind of stuff, pulling in from those global variables, data directory, and uh, I guess just data directory. And what I did instead is I did, I used the more modern path module, which I believe is Python 3.4 and higher, maybe Python 3.3 and higher, don't quote me. Um, it just, it does the more object oriented thing of returning you that object, which you can then call the dot operator on again and then chain your calls together. Just a little bit cleaner, a little bit more pure object oriented programming. So I went ahead and went with that method. Otherwise, it's identical there. And uh, so right here, they have a comment classes for our game objects. They haven't even followed the proper doc string convention. Right here, they kind of did. But as far as I know, it should all really go in here. And uh, what I did is I made it, this is class fist, just to remind you on both of these. This is the original file. Once again, this is my refactored file. So they had it as an action, as though it was like a function to, you know, moves the clenched fist on the screen following, and then it says the mouse. Um, I just picked clenched fist follows mouse. It's shorter, sweeter, and it sounds more like a noun. And that's what I think a class or an object should sound like. So then right here we have the constructor method in it. And... Uh, what I've obviously done is I've jammed a lot more stuff in there, like this fist retracted, fist punching. That's not necessarily exactly the way I would have designed all this from scratch, but what I'm doing is if we come way down here on this left-hand file, the original, I guess way, way down here, where's this fist retracted? Down here it has like a... Uh, if fist punch, you know, it's got all this stuff, and this is all in... um. They have this giant main file, or that's class chimp, I'm sorry. Here we go, def main. So at the bottom of their file, they have this huge, like, that's the beginning of it, and it comes all the way down here. That's all main. It's about three screenfuls on my zoomed-in Python interpreter over here. Let's scroll it down there. Yeah, so there's main. You can see it sets up a screen. That's going to be namespaced. Our entire game screen is going to be namespaced inside this main function. This is sort of what they sometimes call like God functions or objects or whatever, what have you, where they just take on a lot of responsibility. They're multiple screenfuls. They're really things that are screaming to be broken up into multiple uh, objects or at least have their behaviors and values pushed off to more relevant objects instead of floating around. So the problem here in a nutshell is that everything to do with like handling mouse button down, fist punch of the chimp, the sound playing, all this stuff, this is stuff that should be part of the chimp object, right? Like why are we playing punch sound play from out here in the global, the more global namespace? Shouldn't the punch sound being played be played within like the fist or the chimp or something else like more specialized it's just it's an easy trap to fall into if you start writing something in a real generic way from scratch especially not really focusing on like the object oriented principles so what i did is i went ahead and moved that stuff as well into this uh well some stuff i just everything that stayed global i moved into the game object and the game object would be, here's my file. And so there's the media object, which has the load image and the load sound. 
and then we come down we have the fist object then we come down a little bit more then we have the chimp object then we come down and finally we have this class game object and I just have a function called initialize because I decided instead of allowing to make multiple instances of game for now I just want one static class so to speak so instead of doing the double underscore init method like you do in a normal uh, class that you can instantiate objects from I just went ahead and made the full word initialize because we're not supposed to use those double underscore special methods unless we um, we're using them like specifically how Python intends them to be used they're sort they're like reserved for that so even though what I'm doing has a lot of overlap and even Pygame itself would is known to use the double underscore in it method where it probably shouldn't I just changed it so anyway that's that so this is the initialization stuff just like the init method would usually do um, we're going to initialize the pi game subsystems I should probably make that more specialized like init display init whatever um, here's game dot screen now so instead of it necessarily being this like screen local variable inside of this main method that's just sort of there it's a little bit I feel a little bit more readable it's the game screen it kind of denotes what screen it is um, and then I immediately get a rectangle from it to get those coordinates and I add that to a member variable as well and instead of just saying rect or whatever which I think maybe the other one might have said what do we have here game get back up to this initialize class game def initialize and then over here what do we have is that okay it's hmm I don't even know what they did for rectangle I'm not even seeing it But yeah, we'll obviously need that at some point. And um, it sets the caption. This is all stuff to do with like the main game window, right? Set the mouse visibility. Just all the kind of catch-all stuff. This is what they had was they had these functions to create background, etc. Let me see if I can come over here and find those. Um, def main. Did they have those functions? I thought they did. Hmm. Okay, I guess I made them. So they had it commented. I was actually thinking about resorting back to just these comments for this. So, uh, yeah, instead of that, I could just, like, take this code obviously replace this with that code because that's the same exact thing that's getting called and then just make a comment that says create background there to explain what's going on with this chunk of code then there's one less function called so it saves like a tiniest little fraction of a second stuff like that but anyway that's just a style design decision that anybody could make this isn't getting called over and over in a loop so it's not a big deal about any little micro optimizations like that so anyway, it's self-descriptive. That's one good thing. It says create background, game set background text, and then prepare game objects. So if we come in here, create background, it just creates a background surface, uh, basically fills it with that green looking color. Then we create some text. And so right here is where I move that PG font check, that warning fonts disabled thing. I just move that inside of this function, inside of this method, because this seemed to be where it belonged instead of just floating around in space so it's just now local to this set background text method and that's it that's all handled right there then we get to prepare game objects and this is actually more than well i guess it's exactly equal to the sum of its parts but the size of its parts might not be apparent right here so this prepare game objects is is generating is creating these all in java would have the new keyword in from a in front of them but of course that's not needed in Python so game all sprites is calling from the Pygame game sprite module it's using the render playing class which is the same as group it just is a little bit descriptive in its definition of like oh okay this is no fancy stuff right um, 
so I went ahead and added this punchables group and I just used the stock group type, which is exactly the same interface as render plane. Then we create an instance of the chimp object. Here's a demonstration I wanted to get to in a minute about showing how to create a second chimp is this easy right here. This one line of code will create a second chimp since the, uh, pretty much all, I think it, literally all of the behavior of the chimp is encapsulated now within the chimp object instead of like partially in the game loop itself in a series of if statements, total code smell. Um, and then there's the single fist and then here's the clock that we need to initialize at some point so that we could cap our frame rate to 60 frames. This isn't the best practice in the world right here of exactly how they did this. It will cap the game at 60 frames, so any computer greater than or equal to some moderate computer will play the game pretty fairly at the same speed. But you'll notice every so many frames, like every second or two, there's like a little hiccup in the in the frames if you're doing a constant movement and you're really looking at the screen. So it's okay for beginners, but definitely nothing not the way you'd want to do it in a polished game. And right here, what I've done is I get just the mouse buttons. So by Pygame event get, that will get all the Pygame events normally, like what we do right here, what they did previously, and what a lot of people do is that. It just generically gets every type of event. But what I've done right here is I specialized it and said get the mouse down and mouse up events, which there's only one per, you know, pushing the left mouse button down will give you one, lifting the mouse button up will give you one, whatever. A list of those events is extracted and stored in mouse buttons so it's a little bit separate so when we get to this little for loop it doesn't have those mouse buttons in it They're, they've all been stripped out so it's a little bit less checking for this thing to do and this one just like I believe they do in the original is just checking for the quit some type of a quit command you know and uh, yeah so then after that if, it, if we haven't decided to quit it goes ahead and calls game all sprites update. And so this, of course, is our game, our master game object, whatever you want to call it. And uh, all sprites is that that sort of list that has a, it's a group, which is like, you know, a subtype of a list. Like they've added functionality to this group. And, um, that has literally every sprite in it. So what it's going to do is it will effectively call update on each and every one of those sprites that happens to be in that list. And then it's going to pass those mouse buttons to it. And then this draw everything I believe is copied verbatim from what they had. I didn't mess with it. It's just um, going to the game screen surface and then blitting that game background that we generated when we initialized the, the game. And then it's also going to draw all of those uh, sprites to the game screen surface. So the update's just going to do the processing, right? It's going to, if there's like a character or whatever, it's going to move that character, but it's more conceptually, right? It's just moving the coordinates of that character, but it hasn't actually been written graphically yet. So when we get down to that draw part, it's going to graphically write that to the screen surface. And then finally, it's going to update that display. We don't even need this line actually, that Pi Game Quit, because it just should never get there. It, uh, if we're going to quit, it's going to quit there or there. So it will never hit that line. Okay, so I'm going to save this and run it. The frame rate, I think I'm only recording probably at 24 or 30 frames a second, so it might look choppy or whatever on your end. It's, it's a tiny bit choppy on my end too. Not bad though. And there you can see I hit it, I can miss. If I hold the left mouse button down, it holds the fist down. And when I let it up, it lets it up. And if I roll the, the mouse uh, wheel, it will throw a whole bunch of uh, punch events at this moment. I don't know if you can hear that echo or not. But anyway, that's the gist of what's going on there. And if we go to that original and run it, it should look and play exactly the same. So there we have it. We click the mouse button and hold it down, lift it up. We get all that same type of behavior. 
All right. So I'm going to come back up here and start back toward where we left off over here. Back towards the top again. So once again, this original file, this is the new file. The new file is the green one. So whenever you see the green over here, they're saying this stuff is not over here in green. And then it's almost counterintuitive. And then over here where it's blue, it's saying this is changed in the blue file or omitted or whatever. All right, so once again, just going through it, making sure we know it, we've got to import the modules. We do it different. We, you know, obviously Pygame's the same, but otherwise the system level stuff, we import it a little bit differently. We put this stuff into more specialized stuff as well as that stuff into more specialized classes. Instead of leaving it free floating, we grab these two, um, the load sound and the load image over here and we put them inside of this media class. We got load image and load sound. Otherwise they're almost identical. Um, let's see here. So there's that. Did it a little bit different with the path object. This one, the only thing I really changed was the size variable. Uh, it's supposed to be like a tuple. And instead of just having this ambiguous size tuple that where they do all this like math with indexes and scales, it doesn't really like the code's not self-descriptive. So I went ahead and took advantage of one of Python's features of just automatically deconstructing that that tuple into two different variables, x and y, which I feel like are more descriptive. Then I just say, hey, x equals x times scale, which I could probably just say x times equals scale and y times equals scale. I don't know. I guess I felt like that was more descriptive at the time. And then just like they do, I do the same thing right here. This line's effectively the same thing. But instead of just size, we have that X, we pass X and Y back in. And this time we construct a tuple with them on the fly right at the last second. And like I said, I feel like that's a little more readable. Then if color key is not none, I just totally eliminated that line because on the next line down, we say if color key compares to negative one, so if it compares to negative one, then it's not none. <laughs> we don't need to do like a double check. We don't need to check also if color key is not equal to 99, say. It's just it's irrelevant. Uh, this code was originally written, I want to say, close to 20 years ago. So whatever. It's understandable that people might do some redundancies like that. Then we have that looks like it stayed the same for the color key. And then finally we... It also looks like it stayed the same, right? We're just returning the image. It's a, effectively a tuple. We're returning the image and then the image rectangle. We're getting that on the fly. So that's what happens there. That's just a utility thing, which is kind of frowned upon in pure object oriented programming to have utility classes like this that just have these like uh, functions or whatever. But in this case, and at least this iteration, it seemed to make sense. It was cleaner than the previous thing. So chalked it up as an improvement so the next we have uh, this def load sound file name looks like it got a little bit off kilt because of the way that I changed it it didn't line it up perfectly in this diff program but anyway they're right there a little bit off center like I said and the, the reason so is because I put that if statement in there so I injected the if statement right above the class definition of a, an empty interface which is the way to do it because then we instead of like passing back none for the sound file name for example we pass back this actual quote unquote we call it none sound interface right and it has this play method it has the play method so they can still pretend like it's playing sound we can still load a sound file and say here play it you know but all it's going to do is nothing and that way we can reuse that same logic. We don't have to say like, if none, then skip over this and do this other thing. We just say, hey, no matter what, try and play a sound right here. And if the sound's loaded, then it's it'll play. And otherwise, it will just continue on. It saves a lot of uh, source code space in the long run and just makes all the logic a lot simpler. All right. And then what did I do here? If not, PG so that was the part that I put up here. They had it afterwards. And they returned that none sound in that case. And there's where I returned that none sound in that case. 
And then right here, once again, I just use the uh, the path, the more object oriented path object class instead of this uh, OS path module, which is not object oriented. And they return the sound. Do I not return a sound? Yeah, I return PG mixer sound file name. Oh, they saved it to a temporary variable sound and then return that sound. So I just saved a line or two of, in the source code and just did it like that. All right, now we're back to class fist and this one's lined up again. And you can tell I changed the comment. They put move to clench fist on the screen following the mouse. I just pick clench fist following the mouse. Um, the init. You can see right here, I've added the whiff sound instead of they originally had the whiff sound like way down here, way past chimp. Where is it? Um, yeah, it's main. They have this main variable, then they say, uh, Right here, this whiff sound it says prepare game objects, and then it doesn't even really, it just creates this whiff sound floating. So if whiff sound isn't attached to like the fist or the monkey or anything like that, the whiff sounds just attached to the game. So there could be design times when it's like, that might make sense if like, whatever, if it's more of a global sound that like a lot of things use or whatever, or maybe that should go in a, super class refactor back to a super class that loads that sound there's an infinite possibility amount of possibilities all right so where are we we've got the clench fist following the mouse this is required basically the first thing we should do whenever we're inheriting from this sprite class which even i did the same thing as they did uh that's just part of it if you read the documentation on the sprite class over here what are we on sprite and then if we go to, uh, you know, docs ref sprite on pygame.org, click on that. And uh, where do they say that in the documentation? Maybe down here. The base class for visible game objects derived classes will want to override the sprite update and assign a sprite image and sprite rect attributes. So those are basically the three things we need to do. The sprite image is the surface. It's, you know, they use the word image loosely within Pygame, but it usually an image file itself is like a PNG file. That's better for transmitting across the internet or something. But when you have that data loaded in game for rapid uh, blitting to the screen, you're going to want to put it in more of like a code format and not like a file format, if that makes sense. So anyway, they use the word image, but it's really a surface, sort of a misnomer. And then rect is just the uh, get rect value of off of that image just stored there. And updates actually a method and it just accepts whatever key, whatever uh, parameters you want to throw at it. And it kind of just throws them away and sort of does nothing. But when we override it, we can tell it, hey, you know, check for these buttons if they're pushed or a timer or whatever we can do whatever fancy logic we want and it says when subclassing the sprite be sure to call the base base initializer before this adding the sprite to groups so that's what i was saying about that this is the base initializer pi game sprite sprite class init which they probably shouldn't have named it that init but you get the idea and um then we're passing it a reference to ourself so it does whatever stuff behind the scene that we don't really know about for initialization and then returns control back to us. Then of course they take uh, that surface and set it to its self image and um, fill it with the color. Where did they set? I guess they pass in the color right there. Oh, this is, I was thinking this was uh, this example over here of like load image. So here's what we're doing. We have the, this is the homemade interface that they use for load image, um, which is used within the sprite subclasses. This color key is just if you have like one color, like if you're using like a GIF style thing, not like a 
the alpha transparencies where you can have like a variable transparency, right? Like that soft variable transparency. This color key transparency is just like one color, you know, black or pink or whatever. Wherever that color is found in the image is 100% transparent. And otherwise it's whatever the color value is. And scale, which defaults to one, is uh, how big you want to magnify it or whatever. So if that was a two, then it would double the size of the sprite on the screen. And then they're using that OS path instead of the one we use, blah, blah, blah. Where are we at here? So yeah, they did that in a not object-oriented fashion. We did it in an object-oriented fashion. So we do that, that initializer line just because they say so. Then right here, we call media load image, which they had just called the, um, the, the global load image, but otherwise it's basically the same exact thing. And we pass it fist.png with a color key because there is some transparent color in there, which I'm not sure what a negative one would be. Hmm. Um, yeah, and then it deconstructs that to self.image and self.rec, saves those values there. We have a self.whiff sound in ours because we're keeping that sound with the thing that's making it, the fist. And then the self.punch sound, which the fist is also making. Um, the self.state here, what I did was they had had, they have like this if self punching, right? They do that and they test that as like a flag. It's like a true or false kind of a flag. And those to me are code smells like, especially in object oriented programming, you want to minimize if statements and definitely minimize or completely eliminate any sort of flags so what i did was for one thing i made them all caps which signifies that it's like a constant more and what did they do here they did like okay their self punching equals true right if self punching self red maybe this isn't the one okay self punching equals false one of them, I think they like actually point it to a value that's not true or false. This one looks like it all stays true or false there. So yeah, they basically set this state of punching or not being a true or false. And then they make that, um, you know, if not self punching, then make yourself punching. Then make the hitbox a little bit lower and return whether or not that collides. What is that? That's the fist. Okay, so what it's doing is that they're they're shrinking their hitbox so that it's like you have to have at least five pixels of overlap, right? And then they're testing if it collides. What did we do over here? And then they do this unpunch thing where you call it and set punching false. So what I do, where we add an update, okay, well, first in this init method, right? I come over here and I set our current state to uh, self fist retracted. So I have two basic states as fist punching or fist retracted. And when it's fist retracted, it's equal to this tuple. And it's like what they do over here. They set it right here. There as it is, fist offset is right there so then we also have an offset for fist punching and what they did is they just add 15 and 25 to it to the um, that offset and what I did is I, I pre-calculated it and added and subtracted the 15 and 25 because it's negative numbers so if you add a positive 15 and a positive 25 to it it ends up being 220 and 55 so anyway, that's what's going on there because when you get into the nitty gritty of this part where it says move fist to mouse position, then it's going to go, I don't want to say too much right here because I don't remember the exact logic, but I had to pre-calculate it like that the two different times so that it could be used uh, in a simple, consistent manner down here. So yeah, what are they saying we did different here? We go uh, self, rectangle, top left, get mouse position. That's the same thing over here. Top left, get mouse position. But they did it over two lines. 
right? We just did it over one. Then we do this self rectangle move. And it's basically the same thing, but instead of self dot fist offset, which was this thing, right? Which is hard coded to that one. We do it to self dot, let me do, pause this real quick. <clears throat> so what we're doing is instead of setting this offset, down here, like it says, uh, so what it does is it sets self fist offset to this, right? And then down here, it does this relative move of the fist from that offset. So what it does is it's getting the mouse position. Sorry, it's a little tough to describe this part right here. But anyway, once you wrap your head around it, and we'll see moving forward, it will become clearer. But what we have is this self state variable, right? And that self state variable is going to alter between these two absolute, more absolute coordinates. They're actually relative to the mouse cursor position. But uh, yeah, that allows us to just go ahead and like move it absolutely instead of relatively, like what's going on there and instead of altering a flag to say like true or false what we're doing is we're just changing the value of this state variable so instead of saying like if fist retracted equals true then move to here or if self punching move to here else self punching whatever we're just saying set we just later on we just set the state so when the fist is retracted, we just set state to fist retracted. Then no matter what, instead of calling an if thing, we just call self state. We just refer to that, that member and we automatically know. It will just automatically give us the right value that's expected at that time. It's one of the easy ways to eliminate an if statement. And then what we do right here is we actually, from within the object itself, we add ourselves to all sprites. Um, this is a middle of the road, half baked method of doing it. What they had done, if I scroll all the way back down there to their big main method thing, they come in here and they, they prepare their game objects, right? And after they create the chimp and the fist, they just create all sprites from that render plane, kind of like we did. And they, um, they, manually add chimp and fist to it but this is happening outside of the chimp or fist objects themselves so it's an extra step to do you have to know about these objects whatever instead of just it sure be nice if we could just call that and everything kind of plopped into place i feel like that's the better way to go about it so that's what i did up here i added them from within the object itself because that's another way to do it is just to call self dot add and pass it the name of the group instead of the other way around outside so one argument here is that game all sprites is sort of it's a lot like a global variable at least it is namespaced within game but we're calling up we're dealing with a direct property on another object which is bad we want to stick to as close to a hundred percent behaviors as we can in theory, this should be slightly quicker than calling a function. It does have to do a little thing to uh, dereference the dot operator, so that's a very slight performance penalty that can add up over time, especially in loops or things like that. You might want to assign it to a local variable first before processing that loop, so to get rid of the dot operator. Um, but yeah, what what would probably be more pure definitely be more pure in this situation would be to encapsulate this somehow so what I would probably do is instead of calling self add on myself right here I would just create a method on the game object called like add sprite or something and then I would just pass it a reference to self so I would call game dot add sprite self I think that would be the purest way. But for now, this works. And also, Python has mechanisms for re retroactively patching this up if 
you know, this program scaled and, you know, turned into a commercial video game or something like that. And we're like, oh, wow, we need to go back and fix up some of this code for some reason. We could, um, like I said, we could retroactively deal with that in Python. Not in every language. It's not quite so easy. But anyway, that's the initialization process there for that object, which should become a little more clear as we move forward. Then there's this def update method. And what this is, is if you remember, this was stock part of the sprite interface. It's one of the key methods that needs to be there. So what happens is when we call that that update on the group, it will go through each thing and it will in turn call the update method on that thing. And that just happens every frame or whatever. And uh, yeah, in our case, every frame for sure. And of course, it's a method, so it gets a copy of itself, and then it's also getting passed in that mouse buttons that we looked at earlier. And so we have a comment here, move fist to mouse position. So self rect, upper left, top left equals get mouse position. So this mouse position is obviously separate from the mouse buttons, so it, get, it does a quick call to that, gets the mouse position, stores, makes its own rectangle value equal to that position. And then what it does is it doesn't want the image that we're using for the fist, we don't want it to be exactly lined with the mouse cursor like Pygame would do it. So then we do a like a relative move, so to speak, right here. And uh, we move it to self-state, like you can see. We don't move it to self-fist retracted, even though it will do that on, for sure on the first update. It will move to uh, to this position and it will move in place so it won't create a new object it will just mutate or modify the existing one but yeah that's what it does and then when we switch that state later on which happens right here to uh to punching then when it calls self state self state will automatically be pointed at fist punching instead by then which we'll see I'll keep going down here so handle punches that's what this block does it says for event in mouse buttons that value we passed in um, where to go? <laughs> My vision's not lined up. So right there, we're passing in mouse buttons. Right here, we're using it, and we're saying for each event in mouse buttons, if that event type is a mouse button down, or if it's a mouse button up. In the case of a mouse button down, we're going to set the state to fist punching. We're going to move the rectangle. This time, we're going to move it relative, just like they did. And uh, then we're going to call self dot punch. Otherwise, if we do get the mouse up event, then we're going to set it back to fist retracted, which is a little more readable, of course, than just fist offset like they had. And uh, then we're going to also do another relative move for that. But otherwise, self-state will point at that more. So what I was calling more of an absolute position, even though it's still relative, but it's not relative to its previous state. So right here's that punch method. I feel like I'm skipping over something, but I'm sure I'll probably cover it in more detail, whatever it might have been. Uh, this punch method, what I do is I get, I should, I actually sort of branched off and made a chimp FPS file that added a frames per second counter. And I did a little bit more refactoring. What I did here was I, I actually named this punched list because I thought that was a little bit more readable, but... Anyway, this was a slightly older iteration, so it just says punched. It calls Pygame Sprite Collide, which uh, goes into the Game Punchables list, which we also added ourselves to. When did we do that? Okay, Fist doesn't add itself, obviously, to Game Punchables, but Chimp does. If we scroll down here and cheat for a second, we'll see that uh, self.add, we add ourselves to all Sprite and Punchables for the Chimp. So, yeah, what it does is it goes in and it searches the list of punchables and it sees, uh, it slightly shrinks down. I sort of mimicked what they were doing where they, well, what size did they do? I don't know. I don't want to scroll around too much right now, but they shrunk that hitbox by like five pixels, right? Or something. So I went ahead and just did a 90%. I think I did the math on theirs and it was like 0.93 or something. So I just rounded it off to 0.9.
So that's what it's going to do. It's going to it's going to run this algorithm, collide rect, and then I did the ratio. You can just do a regular collide rect or whatever if you want. Um, and then it builds up this list of anything that it might have punched. So then I come in and check the length of that list. And if it's zero, then we didn't punch anything. So go ahead and play that whiff sound, that or whatever it does. And otherwise, uh, for each in punched, um, on each one of those objects, call the get punched method. So we have a little interface that we're expecting. Pass it a reference to ourselves and then play the punch sound because we have punched something. All right, and then the chimp, very similar, a little bit redundant, but hopefully it will help drive the points home. We got the chimp class, inherits from Sprite, has a description, just a comment effectively. And then we get down here to, um, what's this here? Oh, they once again, it's a little offline. That should be lined up more with, this is definite, not def update. So just keep that in mind here. So this definite, they call, they do everything the same as us. We call the sprite in itself. We do the media load image, split that up into an image and a rectangle. And then I did self image original. They had called it self area. I just felt like self image original was, wait, they didn't call it self area, did they? I guess they didn't have a self image original. So I just created a self image original because later on somewhere else they did and I felt like it'd make more sense there. Um, self rec top left is just set to top left. Where did I? Oh, the value top left that's passed in. Okay, so I added that. They originally didn't take any uh, extra parameters there, but I went ahead and set a default parameter of top left, which will automatically be 1090, which if you look in their source code right here, they have 1090. So I just put it there instead, right? So no matter what in Python, that's going to make it default to the value 1090 if nobody passes in a top left parameter. And if they do then it will take that value. So either way, this will populate this with the proper value. 1090 or whatever's passed in, self.rotation is zero. They don't have a self.rotation thing, so I added that for reasons we'll see later. The self.delta is how much we're moving at a time. They just called it self.move. I felt like delta was, you could use whatever you want, of course, but it's just a little bit more descriptive, right? Self.move almost sounds like a function itself. So I made it one. I made it self.walk right here. Um, self.move is going to work a lot like self.state for the fist did. Self.move is going to work like that for the chimp. Because the chimp can either be moving side to side or it can be rotating, spinning on its axis when it gets smacked. So... Initially, it's going to be moving side to side, so that's what I did. I set it to, to point to this method right here, this walk method that they called it. And then, of course, it adds itself, like we briefly went over before, to all sprites and punchables. All sprites needs to be there just to, we basically use that to draw everything, right? And then punchables, of course, during the check, when it checks uh, whether or not something was punched. So you could have a dozen or whatever... Uh, groups you know effectively lists of sprites and have them for all different reasons you know stuff that reacts on timers or whatever it's just an efficient way to categorize and group things together so that you can do uh, operations wholesale against them so this def update that's what we just covered right well i'm disoriented again Okay, so we did all that. They had self dizzy equals false. So I think self dizzy was the one they used. If self dizzy, then spin self walk. Let's see down here if they. If self dizzy plus 12. So it's like, how is self dizzy plus 12, right? Up here it was true or false. Self dot dizzy false. And then down here, they're adding 12 to self.dizzy, which is hardcore code smell. Um, yeah, and that variable just is totally confusing name to me. It's like, <laughs> so that was really bad. So I refactored all of that to 
you know, I obviously just got rid of the self dizzy thing. That was a state slash numeric value as they felt convenient. Let's get synced back up over here on my file. Um, so update Walker spin depending on state. I'm just going to maybe stick a little bit more to my file now. And um, move monkey across screen turning at ends. New position equals self rectangle move da, 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 so based on the self delta. So the self delta is the amount of change. That amount of change is 18 pixels per frame. It's going to move. And that gets saved to this new position variable. Then it checks if the game screen uh, doesn't not contain our rectangle then we need to flip directions so 18 would become negative 18 or negative 18 would become positive 18 in the direction it's moving left or right it would excuse me it would affect that and then it goes ahead and moves based on that and what they had done is they actually said they had two things they said if it doesn't contain our rectangle and if the rectangle is off going off either side of the screen but if it doesn't contain our rectangle then it's going or already off of the screen anyway so we don't need to do that double check so i just got rid of that redundancy um otherwise for the most part it's the same this self image transform flip thing right here that's basically the same thing and that's just going to flip on the horizontal or i guess you would you say on the vertical axis? It's going to flip it which way it's facing horizontally. And finally, we set our rectangle to the new position, whatever that ends up being. And then spin obviously spins the monkey image. And right here we get, we're basically taking this self.rec.center and just making it a local variable. Um, and the point for that is, what do we have here? Do we ever use center again even? I don't know. For some reason, when I'm recording a video, I can't ever find anything. But when obviously watching it, it's a lot easier to find stuff. So I apologize about that. Looks like we're using center right here. Hmm. That just seems kind of bizarre the way it's done that might be able to do some more optimization some of this stuff i just sort of uh cut and pasted excuse me at least initially just so that like to get everything sort of quickly refactored into better places but i might not have gone through and fine tooth comb some of it obviously but this still works i changed the word dizzy to rotation you can see all these changes um then the self move so instead of setting self dizzy equals false i just set self move to the walk so if it was dizzy if that was true it would be in this like spinning state right this self spin state that we set right here for get punched but i just yeah it, it just takes care of it all then there's no more testing it's like okay we know we already did a test right here once and for all and we can just set that state back and just call it willy-nilly without even running tests or knowing what all the possible states are in other places or anything. Self-image equals self-image original. Okay, so they had just called it self-original. That's what it was. And I decided to call it self-image original because it more clearly states what it is. And otherwise, we do the same things, right? So we obviously had to change that to original and then self-rotation instead of dizzy. Sorry, I'm getting a runny nose here. Okay, self rect image, get rectangle center. So this punch, we were able to eliminate a lot of code. Or at least reduce the comment. And uh, we didn't even have to change the image. We just set this this move state to spin. Where does the image get set? Right here. Huh, interesting. Okay, anyway, then we finally get down to the game class, which roughly lines up with main. That's cool that they kind of figured that out a little bit. I guess they just caught the indention in the word initialize, and that was... That's trippy. Okay, so we init the stuff. We init the stuff. What do we do here? We set up the screen. 
we set the title we set the mouse visibility to false we create a background and set the text on the background and prepare the game objects this convert i forgot to mention earlier that converts the pixel format of the the image or the surface to the screen the screen the specific pixel format of the screen so if you're just doing one single blit of an image or a surface one time and then that surface is going to get obliterated and recreated or whatever then you probably don't need to run convert but if you have like a regular sprite that you're reusing in your game and it's running in loops and stuff um, basically if you're blitting the same sprite more than one time you should always convert it so that it more op because otherwise it's doing that conversion on the fly so if you're only going to blit it one time then you don't even have to convert it because it's going to do it that one time on the fly which is a very slight performance hit or maybe more than slight um yeah it's fill in the background what we got here so yeah now we start deviating quite a bit it's not going to be a one-to-one -one translation because ours is way more object oriented over here so we create that background once again, just focusing more on my implementation over here on the right. We create the background, simple thing, create a surface by getting the size of the screen. So the surface is going to be the size of our screen, mostly readable code, get bank. Then we're going to convert that background. We could have just called convert at the end of this right here. The one bad thing about that is then it's kind of hard to see it. You know, it's way over here, peeling off the right. And it's like, I don't know. But then otherwise you got to have a whole other line of code, sort of that type of a readability trade-off. In other languages, it's easier to just stack the the chain commands underneath each other. Like game, um, you could put the dot .convert on the next line by itself. But in Python, it doesn't always quite work out that readable, so whatever. Then we fill it just like they did up there. Okay, then we're going to set the background text. Obviously, these are in the same order as they are called up here. Test if the font uh, module was initialized. And if it was, then go ahead and, um, you know, create a font object. On that font object, call the render method and pass it this text and some values. Set a text position where we want that to display. Blit, huh? Okay, so it's actually blitting that text, game background blit. It's blitting it to the background. I might take issue with that. I don't know if I want it blitting itself. Maybe that's, this would be better off in its own little object, even if it's nested within this one. But anyway, those are just thoughts. And otherwise, of course, print warning fonts disabled and don't return any text or anything. Just leave the background blank and then prepare game objects we got to have the all sprite and the punchable list or uh, groups created so that we can add the objects to them like the fist which will add itself from within its own code and then of course we need the game clock for right there to help modulate our game um and then so i put everything what is basically this while loop i put inside an execute method and what that allows us to do down here at the bottom, see, they had originally said if name compares to main, little Python idiom that is like, uh, you'll only run this code that's outside of the classes or functions or what have you. You'll only run that code if the name of your module's main. And the trick Python, the interpreter does is if you basically like double click, like if you run your Python file, as a program then the name will be main but if you import that file as a module the name won't be main so that's that's what's going on there so they're saying you know if we're not importing this module if we're actually trying to run it as a program itself then go ahead and call main and that allows you to do like test driven development all little stuff like that so what I did is since I moved everything into a game object and then I made that initialize method, like I said, so I feel like this kind of reads like a sentence, like object oriented programming really should. So it's game initialize, then execute. And of course that execute, like I was saying is right here. And it's just starting a while true loop. 
which is kind of weird. They did going <laughs> while going, which I guess is more readable to them. But anyway, and they do have the clock tick right there. Okay, so I just copied them. I think I usually put the clock tick on mines right down here somewhere so they can run all this stuff and then it will wait and update. Not the hugest deal in the world. Uh, we handle the input events. Obviously, like I said, we store a bunch of stuff off or the mouse buttons. We pull them out, check if they're trying to quit. And if they're not, go ahead and update all the sprites and give them the values of the mouse buttons just in case they want them. And then draw everything to the screen and update it. And that's that. That is the program. So let's go back and run. Sorry, you might want to turn down the sound a little bit. There sounds hideously hideous and annoyingly loud. Um, let's just make sure this works. I'm going to hit F5. All right, we got sound. This is working. All looks like it's working like it should. Our little manual test. So now what can we do quickly to like demonstrate extending the program, right? So like I mentioned at the, towards the beginning, we can come in here and just literally uncomment this. And then we have a game chimp 2. And it has slight... I flipped the coordinates. I think the other one was like 1090 to start. So I just flipped the coordinates on that optional parameter that I added. And made them 9010 so that it's a little bit staggered. So you can tell that there's two chimps there. And I don't even have to add it. to. That was one of the benefits of doing having the object itself attempt to add itself to the sprite to uh, all sprites and punchables and all that is that then i only have one line here i don't have to come down to a second place and be like oh yeah and add my new object to this list so that makes it very easy to like almost just checkbox style enable it so let's run it and see and there you go there's two chimps just like that and both of them have all the functionality that you expect and they're you know they don't both spin when you hit one unless you hit them both let me see if i can get just one like that but yeah that's how easy it is and that's i mean it's that idea basically scales to uh oops so we could add a frames per second counter as well. Things like that. So I do have that file, frames per second. And if we come in here, let me maximize this. Um, I think I might have broke this file though. But we can copy and paste and steal from it and add it to our other one for illustrative purposes. So I have this frames per second counter class right here. And it has an initialization method. It takes something that has default background colors or whatever. Um, since it's a sprite, it also has to call that thing, that initializer. Then we go ahead and just copy over these parameter values. We copy them over to member values. And we also set a font because it's going to have digits. And then we call update on itself to generate the surface image. I did that just because that seemed to save code. I had this same thing twice and I thought, you know what? I call it an update, so it's just easier just to call the update method. In the future, that might change if I was to really put in some work on this program and whatever. That might not always work, right? And then we set the self.rectangle. We go ahead and get that so that it's there because that's an expected part of the so-called interface. Even though it's not a method, it's a variable, but it's same effect. Um, and then I create this event, this FPS event. So this is just the boilerplate pattern to create an event in Pygame. And we take that and we set a timer. And we have that timer fire off that event four times a second, every 250 milliseconds. If I'm doing the math right. Maybe that's a little uh less than four times a second yeah it's more of the dividable by 16 or whatever version of that and then we add ourselves two games all sprites just like the other sprites do and of course there's the update method that all of them need that gets called once per frame and when it gets called it uh, takes that font object on itself 
and it renders a new frame rate like it gets the current frame rate and what i did here is i go game clock get fps and it um or excuse me not a knit but integer string so it takes the game clock it gets the frames per second it converts it to an integer and then it converts that integer to a string so that it will render to the font properly and i could have done obviously those built-in methods where it's like int and then the parentheses and then make that uh str and then the parentheses but this is technically uh, very so slightly faster because those particular built-in functions global functions turn around and just call these methods that's not always the case though and one of the trade-offs with object-oriented programming is python has some built-in optimizations with things like if you were to say three plus three versus making like a three add three method the three plus three with the symbols is going to work faster because it can do a trick called constant folding just something to keep in mind that there's like not necessarily a silver bullet in this case the bullet was lined with silver but anyway not always the case all right well what happened where did we bounce from okay so that's that and that looks like it's about the end of there um the end of that method so then we have our regular media we have our fist do i notice anything changing major in there no we have the chimp. I might have made these lines a little bit. I might have added like the white space there or something to make it more readable. Okay, and then I started, this is where I broke it. I started to change the rotation. I'll show you, I'm gonna add this. I'll just shut up and do it. All right, so we'll come down here. We'll copy this out. And effectively import it into our Wait, that's the shell. Where's our chimp? There's our regular chimp file. We'll go way up back to the top and just put it. All right, so now our regular chimp file has that frames per second counter. And if we run it, we're not going to see a difference. It's just going to look the same as it did when we originally ran it, right? I don't see any frames per second counter. I do see the two chimps. Well, the reason is, you probably know, we didn't instantiate it. Let's look at the interface. What does it need? So this init self, it can take two optional parameters. Oh, that code's just kind of like, I feel like that's ugly like that. I'll at least give it one more space like that. Okay, so it takes two optional parameters, background color and foreground color. We don't have to set it, it has defaults. So we can just call FPS counter by itself. And instead of um, another option, instead of it knowing about game, game all sprites right there, we could also make that a parameter and pass it in. So it would be, when you hear about reusable object-oriented code and stuff like that, and you might think like, oh, object-oriented code's never fully reusable. It's There's always some context it's bound to. Well, if you pass in everything that varies as a parameter, as an argument, then it truly does become reusable when done properly. But anyway, that's just a little side note. Okay, so prepare game objects. Come down here. We want to do, I guess, maybe set it up after the clock. I don't know. Uh, so that was... We'll call it self. Wait, there was no self because it doesn't have an instance game. Dot FPS counter. Equals. I might not even have to make a variable of itself. I'll do it for the moment, but I think I might be able to just create it. We'll see. Of... Uh, and that's FPS counter with no parameters, just using those default values. Now we should have an FPS, a frames per second counter. In theory, let's see, maybe an error. Oh, we've got it up there in the corner. 60 frames per second, 50, whatever. It's sort of an approximation, but we're getting around 60 frames per second.
Well, we can uncap that. We can come back here, find where that 60 was. And if we get rid of that 60, it's like a thousand frames per second. So now if we do it, we might be able to see some more of the hiccups because we saw it was running at 59, 60 frames a second. Not a big deal if a frame or two drops here or there at all. Um, but if you're losing like 100 frames at a time, going from hundreds of frames a second to 800 frames a second, then you know there's something going on that's performance taxing, right? I'm not going to get too deep into this on this video, but it's something I would like to cover in the future. Okay. I'm recording a video, so normally this would be over 300, but I don't know if you can see or not. It looks like it's, I'm seeing 140, 160, 170, 130-ish, like, types of things in there. Okay, I'm going to start hitting them, and we see it slows way down. See that frame rate? It's slowed down to, like, 40, 50 frames a second. And I can scroll the mouse wheel and get a bunch of punches in there. Okay, so I wonder what that is. What's slowing it down, right? That's a, that's a drastic frame rate reduction. Um, so I could run a profile or whatever and figure it out. It's better to do that than to assume like, oh, I'm, you know, I shouldn't have had these so many function calls. That that must have been what it was. I called too. I made it too clean and object oriented. That's what my problem is. It's not the problem at all. I've actually have profiled that code and you could tell just when i was running it that the time when it was happening was when the monkeys were spinning see that's when it slowed down so this particular case is slow enough motion where you can tell where that problem happens and both monkeys were spinning too which is really a performance hit so if we go to the chimp class since that's where it's going on and we've moved most or all of their functionality there we go to this uh, spin thing and we start digging through it. We can see we have some rotation going on and then we have this transform rotate call. That's what this is. And uh, yeah, so what we're doing is we're, we're actually recalculating and running that exact process of like moving those pixels to rotate those monkeys around. It's not like we don't have pre-rendered monkey rotations. So that's what I was starting to kick around in this other one over here was um, get back down there to that code. So I had four rotation in range. I don't know exactly what I was thinking right here, but I guess I thought like I'll just have a, a list of um, positions. There's going to be 12 of them up to 360 something like that and then i was just going to go through those so what it would do is when it loads the monkey most likely i would have it like pre-render those positions at that time during the stage load or the game load or what have you and then when it goes to render it it would just switch the monkey state to each one of those rotations instead of recalculating them and calling that um that transformation thing and the same thing with flip too if you run the profiler on it you'll see that flip probably takes up the second most amount of runtime i don't think flips super heavy though it just does that one flip and i think the game's just so fast overall that that one kind of bubbles up more than it deserves to but the same thing could be done with this as well and it could be pre-rendered. It's the time-space trade-off, right? So this is technically using CPU computation time instead of memory space. And so if you're trying to keep your program really small, memory size smaller, whatever, this is probably going to be your best bet. But if you rather go for use up a few more megabytes of memory or something, then um, then to pre-render it, that will probably give you more speed because it can just reference that. But anyway, that's how easy it is to extend that program, how we're just literally adding, you know, pasting in that FPS counter, which doesn't have to be pasted in. It could be brought in. I could have an FPS counter.py file and I could import it up here and then it would still be just as easy to uh, to bring it into the game down here in this prepare game objects. We'd probably do like we could either just import this class or it would be like fps counter dot fps count you know something like how pygame does it whatever it's all up to us 
So that is the benefits. Sorry the video drug out a little longer than sometimes I like them to drag out. I like to try and keep them well under an hour, but uh, yeah, I just, I don't feel like it drug out too long considering the amount of ground that we covered, but hopefully this shows you the uh, at least the initial benefits of object-oriented programming, and not just even for video games, for everything. We could take these conceptual objects and just sort of give them their own identity, get, make them their own entity, make them responsible for themselves, you know, make them grown-ups, not treat them like something that you heard around and all over the place and, you know, just not conceptually clean or whatever. The other way is it's just too sprawled out. There's too many global variables and stuff. Once again, last time I'll say it, not the hugest deal on a small program, but once the program starts scaling, it just... Anybody who's done any programs, any larger, knows that it's just a pain in the butt very quickly. And it gets hard to add things. It's like, oh yeah, you got to remember all 10 places to change stuff, all that. But yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, leave any comments or whatever. I like to hear back from people. Take it easy.